everyone. Uh, my name is Mo. Uh, I'm on the Uber Eats data science team. And today I'll be talking to you about learning word to back embeddings for hex cluster generation. Uh, probably the title probably makes no sense to you at the moment, uh, but hopefully uh, by the end of the session, you will understand how to actually apply this methodology to whatever data sets you're trying to solve. All right, so let me start with a quote from my manager. At Uber, maps are part of our DNA. Uh, so what this literally means is if we look at, at the very ground level of the world map, then the problem we want to solve is which mega region, which country, and which cities should we actually launch our products, right? Uh, and if we zoom in a little bit into, say, a specific region, so here shown is uh, Los Angeles downtown. And what you can see, uh, this is the demand heat map for rides. Uh, so what this really means that is the demand is not distributed evenly on this map, right? And we have a lot of problems if, there, if demand distribution is different from supply distribution on the geo level. And if we zoom into specific trips, then we have very rich uh, geo data about them. So a trip uh, li literally can start at the time that the driver is driving around on the map and doing nothing and didn't get any dispatches. And then at the time they get a dispatch request and accept the request. So we record the dispatch acceptance location. And then the driver goes um, to the rider location to pick up the rider. So we have rider location and then driver uh, pick up the rider and then drop off the rider at a drop off location. So at Uber, we actually track the entire route that the driver is taking. Uh, and this is very rich data set that we can play with. So um, let's start with how do we describe geos at Uber. Um, there are two things here. So one on the left, what you're seeing is uh, what we call a city. But the Uber city is kind of different from the city in your perception. So for instance, um, what's shown here, it's the city of San Francisco in the Uber definition. But the actual San Francisco Bay Area is like this little tiny 10 fourth of the city. Um, it actually, as a city of San Francisco, goes all the way north until we almost hit Oregon, and then it goes all the way south uh, to like Bakersfield. So if we have one consistent zone and then we have like one single policy for that zone, it doesn't really make sense because we lose that whole granularity in the geo level. And what comes in handy is uh, the H3 library. So you guys are now experts of search, uh, thanks to Alice. Uh, so this, these are actually the hexagon uh, mappings that we use at Uber. This powers search and powers other, uh, other applications as well. And these, uh, what I'm showing is hexagons at level nine, which are the smallest hexagons that we play with, uh, with our products. And these are the basis hexagons that I will use for this clustering work. So um, because of all these maps data, uh, it results in a lot of interesting but challenging problems. So one of those problems is the supply positioning problem. Uh, so let's look at, look at this very simple example. Assume now it's 5 p.m. at night and we have four hungry eaters uh, that are trying to order. And they're like, I want this burger really bad. Um, however, all of these eaters are located at San Francisco downtown area. And what happens is we don't really have that many couriers around this area. And we have four couriers who are one at like Sunset, uh, one like South San Francisco and so on and so forth. So if we dispatch these couriers to take care of those orders, uh, it's very inefficient because one, eaters need to wait for a long time for couriers to arrive to a near location and then pick up food and then do the delivery. Um, and two, for the couriers, they need to first navigate to the target regions in order to uh, pick up food. And they don't really get paid for that distance they traveled to reach that uh, restaurant location. So this, is a, this, this can be a big problem uh, because we really lose that efficiency in the matching in this case. So search is a way to solve it. Um, but in addition to search, um, there are free ways that we can tell couriers that you should be going to this region maybe around 5 p.m., right? Um, and then the first step we need to do is how do we define this region? 
Uh, so this entails this entire problem of how do we segment a map into different zones so that we can have different policies at different zones, we can have different incentives, or we actually just show some information for these different zones to help uh, careers make informed decisions. All right, so very intuitively, how should these zones look like? Um, I ask around some of the colleagues and these are the answers I get. So one, they should probably have a good separation of city and water. So if we have a zone that have both city and water, and imagine you give like a three times surge multiplier, curves are like, what the heck is this, right? Um, and then we probably want smooth boundaries, so curves don't need to like get into the problem of crossing different multipliers uh, when they're traveling on the map. And then they should somewhat be convex in shape, so they look nice. Um, and then we probably need to control for uh, the granularity and the sizes of those zones. And we probably would as also need different granularities for different products. And then maybe we should have uh, smaller and more clusters in busier areas so we get the granularity of those trip distributions. And in general, they should look fairly nice if we want to show them to the careers. So what I'm showing here is a segmentation of the map manually drawn by our ops friends. So they actually look pretty nice. Uh, so they satisfy most of these conditions. And then um, you can see they have fairly smooth boundaries and with granularity that kind of uh, applies to the municipal underlying city geos. But they're not based on any trips data that we are seeing. So if we map these with the actual raw trips data, what we see is they have Berkeley, Oakland, San Leandro uh, and Alameda as one big zone. But if we look, really look at the trips, then we see huge density of trips surrounded at the UC Berkeley area. So a lot of hungry students uh, trying to feed themselves. Uh, and, then, and then by putting Berkeley together with these different zones, it reduces our ability to really tell careers that, hey, you should actually be close to UC Berkeley rather than like in San Leandro and getting no dispatches, right? And the same problem is observed for San Francisco, where we have a big San Francisco zone that um, includes the downtown area as well as like Richmond and Sunset, uh, but most trips are actually concentrated at the downtown area. Uh, so how do we really leverage those trip data that we have to separate, segment a map into different zones. Uh, the, the answer is using where to vac embeddings plus hierarchical clustering. Big shout out to the driver intelligence team uh, who are actually the very first team to apply this where to vac framework to this kind of hex clustering problem. And uh, on the high level, why this works is um, in the word to vac world, we are trying to quantify the similarity of words, right? Uh, so like, I don't know, blue and yellow are closer than like blue and king, I guess. Um, and in our case, what we're trying to do is to find hexagons that are similar to each other. So we can cluster them into one cluster, right? So there are actually very much uh, potentials in applying word to vac to a lot of problems outside the natural language processing world, uh, and they can be very useful for like sparse data sets. So let's get into a little details of word to vac for those that are not really familiar with it. So here in the example, we have a sentence, uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And then we are trying to extract training samples out of the sentence. And how we do this is uh, let's designate a window size of two. And we start with the first word as the target word, the, and then quick and brown are the two words that are of pro, uh, close proximity to this word. So we generate training samples, the and quick and the and brown. And then we can move this window to the right. So he, right now uh, the target word is quick and then the neighboring words are the brown fox. And we can do this uh, all the way until we hit the last of the sentence. And then we can do this for multiple sentences. So what we essentially learn is we we generate training samples so that the words are always close together that when they show up in sentences. And now with those training samples, we can feed them uh, into a neural network. 
So this is a very shallow neural network with just one hidden layer. And what we can do is we first one hot encode the input and output, and then we um, just feed the training data through this. And ultimately, we don't really care about the classification, uh, classification accuracy of this model, but we want to take the middle hidden layer and use that as embeddings for each input word. So as you can see, uh, getting out of this, we are having um, a real numbered uh, vector uh, of the dimension of the number of neurons in that hidden layer. So this is basically a futurization method that we can use to describe the word. All right, so that's for word to vac How do we really apply this in the hex cluster context? So the, question, uh, the problem here is um, what's similar to a word in our context is really a hexagon. So this is a hexagon UUID. So we regard that as a word in our hex cluster world. And then instead of a sentence, what we have are trips. Uh, so here I'm using the restaurant location and then followed by the either drop off location. So intuitively, word to vac uh, tries to classify whether two words are similar by what other words they always appear with uh, in a sentence. And what we're trying to do is uh, we want to find two hexagons that are always appearing with other the similar set of hexagons, right? So there are two cases. One is um, with the same restaurant hexagon, a lot of trips actually goes to like a destination hexagon A and a destination hexagon B. And we think A and B are similar, right? Or the other way around, like there is an either hexagon and then there are two restaurant hexagons that always delivers to that either hexagon. Then we think these two restaurant hexagons are similar to each other. So that's the basic idea of how similarity is defined. All right, so with that, uh, we can apply this embedding framework to our hexagons. And eventually we ended up with a matrix that, uh, it's not really a matrix, a table that uh, for each hexagon UUID, we have, uh, this is a 50 dimensional uh, real number to describe this hexagon. And now we have this featureization, we can then apply clustering methodologies, right? So we're using a canonical hierarchical clustering, um, but there are, some, there are some modifications that we need to make. So let's look at a quick example. So assume uh, that we only have five hexagons we want to cluster. That's A, B, C, D, and E. Um, and then, oh, let's do this side. Uh, and then, um, First of all, we want to make sure that we can only cluster hexagons if they're neighboring to each other, right? So imagine in a world that um, two hexagons are very close in terms of their distance of similarities, but they're actually not in close proximity of uh, geo level, then we are going to end up with disjoint uh, components that form one hex cluster, which is not desirable. So one constraint that we reinforce is there should be connectivity. And then um, the second thing that is, what distance should we use? Um, so we can compare the pairwise distance and here we are using a one linkage, which minimizes the within cluster variance. So for each pair of connected hexagon, we can compute this one linkage and then we merge, uh, we cluster together the pair that's, uh, that give us, gives us the smallest within cluster variance. So for instance, uh, let's assume A and B got clustered together, and then we can continue this process. Um, so C and D gets clustered together, and then so on and so forth, until we reach the state that we only ended up with one big hex cluster that has all the hexagons, right? So now how do we decide where to cut? Uh, because ultimately we want a segmentation. We don't want like a big, uh, city ID that goes from all the way north to all the way south, right? Um, so we can cut at different levels for the desired granularity. So basically, if we want uh, less granular ones, we can cut like between three and four. Um, if we want more granular ones, we can cut between one, two, and three. Um, and then as you can see in this image, these are the resulting hex clusters. All right, so these are the resulting hex clusters. Um, 
Let's take a look. So in San Francisco, what we're seeing is uh, San Francisco downtown is on its own now. Uh, it's separate from Richmond on Sunset. And then if we look at East Bay, we see that UC Berkeley actually gets its own little hex cluster. Um, so, that, you know, so that the students are not going to hung, be hungry anymore. Um, but there are some potential issues with these resulting hex clusters. Uh, if we take a look at this part, um, so here, this part, uh, then what you're really seeing is the boundary is not very smooth. It's wiggling a lot. And what, why this is bad is imagine a career that tries to travel from like the left end to the right end. Then uh, if we have different incentive levels at these two zones, then the incentive level will change like 20 times in the 10 minute uh, drive, right? So this is not really a good experience and it's, it can be really confusing. So how can we fix that? Uh, so we actually carried out a lot of post-processing processing steps uh, to reassign hexagons to other neighboring clusters if we see this kind of rough boundaries. So just a list of few of post-processing modules that we developed. Uh, one is the boundary smoothing, uh, where we, for each target hexagon, we take a look at its direct neighbors, so the six neighbors around it, and then we actually take a look also at the level two neighbors. And if most of the neighbors belong to a different hex cluster, then we just reassign uh, the hex cluster for this hexagon. And uh, one problem it actually entails is we are starting to see disjoint hex clusters, as shown here. So why is that? Um, so before we do the boundary smoothing, there's actually a bridge in between these two zones. But now with this aggressive smoothing, what happens is for the things on the bridge, uh, they think that most of their neighbors belong to a different hex cluster. So they get reassigned. But this little region didn't get reassigned because of this brute force algorithm. Uh, so we have uh, another post-processing step that we split these multiple polygons and then reassign the very small ones to their neighboring hex cluster uh, to make sure things look nice and even. And there's also additional work on hex cluster naming, uh, which is basically using the hexagon UUIDs and using the hexagon municipal characteristics uh, to uh, name those zones so that we can surface them to careers. All right, so at the very end, this is the final result we get from the smoothing. Uh, so as you can see here, the boundaries are much more smoothed out. Uh, and then we still keep this nice correspondence to the raw trips data. Uh, 